In this video, we are going to solve a problem that will help us to explore the whole spectrum of transportation problem. That's from constructing transportation tableau to all the way down to balancing demand and supply, setting initial feasible solution, optimizing the feasible solution, and calculating the optimal transportation cost. Here is the question. Anatol Motors Ethiopia has three plants to supply passenger vehicles of model Tucson to three automobile dealers in Kenya. The monthly demand at the three dealers are 250. 350 and 300 cars respectively. Supply from plant 1, plant 2 and plant 3 respectively are 230, 370 and 320 cars per month. The transportation cost per car from plants to dealers is given in the table below. Unit cost is given in dollar. This is the cost matrix for the transport of a single car from a certain plant to a particular dealer. The equation is determine the optimal shipping schedule and calculate the optimal transportation cost. The cost matrix contains all the three sources, all the destinations, and the unit transportation cost from source to destination. Thus, we can convert this cost matrix into transportation tableau just by adding supply from each source at the right-hand margin corresponding to the source and demand at each destination at the bottom margin of the tableau. As we discussed in part one of this installment, transportation simplex method is based on the fact that total supply should be equal to total demand. So, to check their equality, let's add demand and supply separately. Total demand is equal to 250 plus 350 plus 300, which is equal to 900. And total supply is equal to 230 plus 370 plus 320, which is equal to 920 cars. Since total supply is greater than total demand by 20 cars, a dummy destination has to be added, and the excess 20 cars has to be considered as the demand of this dummy destination in order to make the model balance it. Dummy destination is an imaginary destination with zero transportation cost because there is no physical item that is actually transported to this destination. In other words, it's simply added to make demand and supply are equal. Hence, the transportation cost from each plant to this dummy destination is zero. The balanced transportation problem, which is used to set initial feasible solution, look like this. Let's proceed to set the initial feasible solution by using least cost cell method. We can also use Northwest Corner Cell method or Vogel's approximation method for setting the initial feasible solution. In whatever method we set the initial feasible solution, the optimal transportation cost we are going to determine is the same. So let's dive into the steps of this cost cell method. Step 1, select the cell with minimum cost and allocate as much flow as possible to that minimum cost cell by choosing the smaller one from the corresponding demand and supply. The minimum transportation cost is zero. Three cells, that is the cells, under the column of dummy destination are on tie with this minimum cost. The smaller one from the corresponding demand and supply that can be allocated to each of these three cells is the same, that is 20. Since we can choose either of them as the least cost cell. For this particular scale, let's choose the cell as the intersection of row 1 and column 4 as the minimum cost cell. And the amount that can be allocated to this cell is 20. After such allocation, we have to proceed to step 2. That's Reduce row supply and column and demand by the amount allocated to the selected list cost cell. Subtracting the allocated 20 from the 20 demand reduces the demand to zero. And also subtracting the allocated 20 from the 230 supply reduces the supply to 210. The rule following this reduction is that if all the supply is consumed, reduce it to zero and eliminate the corresponding row from further consideration by drawing a line through it. We can't eliminate row 1 because its supply is not reduced to 0, rather than 210 units left unconsumed. The other rule is that if all the demand is fulfilled, reduce it to 0 and eliminate the corresponding column from further consideration by drawing a line through it. The demand of dummy destination is reduced to 0, since we have to eliminate column 4 by drawing a line through it. Step 3. Look at the uncrossed out cells to identify the next list cost cell and then continue with step 1 for all unlined rows and columns until all demand is satisfied and all supply is consumed. At this stage, we have three destination demands left unsatisfied and three origin supplies left unconsumed. So we have to continue our allocation and reduction from step 1. From the uncrossed out unit costs, the minimum is $100. Two cells, that's the cells at the intersection of row 1 and column 1 and row 2 and column 2 are on tie with this minimum cost. In such case, we have to choose the cell that can receive more assignments. Demand and supply corresponding to the cell at the intersection of row 1 and column 1 are 250 and 210 respectively. The smaller one from these two, that's 210, has to be allocated to the selected cell. 
On the other hand, demand and supply corresponding to the sale at the intersection of row 2 and column 2 are 350 and 370 respectively. So the swallow one from these two that can be allocated to the sale is 350. 350 is greater than 210. So from the two types sales that has to be chosen to receive the first allocation is the one at the intersection of row 2 and column 2. And the amount that has to be allocated to this sale is 350. Subtracting the allocated 350 from the corresponding demand and supply reduces the demand to zero and supply to 20. Column 2 has to be eliminated by drawing a line through it because destination to demand is reduced to zero. 100 is the next least cost among the unleaded unit costs. The smaller one from the corresponding demand and supply that can be allocated to this sale is 210. Deducting the allocated 210 from the 250 demand at the bottom reduces the demand to 40. And also deducting the allocated 210 from the 210 supply at the right reduces the supply to zero. Since plant one supply is reduced to zero, row one has to be deleted by drawing a line through it. Among the four unlined unit costs, 110 is the least one. Unfulfilled demand corresponding to this sale is 40, and unconsumed supply corresponding to this sale is 20. The smaller one from these two that can be allocated to this sale is 20. Subtracting the allocated 20 from the 40 demand at the bottom and from the 20 supply at the right reduces the demand to 20 and the supply to zero. Row 2 has to be crossed out because plant 2 supply is reduced to zero. From the two uncrossed out unit costs, the smaller one is 140. Demand and supply corresponding to this sale are 20 and 320 respectively. So the amount that can be allocated to this sale is 20. Deducting this allocated 20 from the 20 demand at the bottom reduces the demand to zero. Also deducting this 20 from the 320 supply at the right reduces the supply to 300. Column 1 has to be eliminated by drawing a line through it because dealer 1 demand is reduced to zero. 150 is the only undeleted unit cost. Unconsumed supply corresponding to this sale is equal to the demand corresponding to the sale, which is equal to 300. So 300 has to be allocated to this sale. Deducting the allocated 300 from the corresponding demand and supply reduces both the demand and supply to zero. At this stage, all demand and supply are reduced to zero. So the initial feasible solution looks like this. This initial feasible solution has to go through the steps of iteration in order to make it optimal. So let's proceed to the steps of iteration. Step one, calculate the row index, that's U sub I, and column index, that's B sub J, for the occupied sales and the net evaluation index, that's E sub IJ, for the unoccupied sales. The formula for calculating the row and column index is row index, that's U sub I, plus column index, that's B sub J, is equal to unit cost of a particular set, that's C sub IJ. By the way, when we express the unit cost as C sub IJ, the subscripts I stand for row and J stands for column. So when we say C sub 1, 1, we mean that the unit cost of the sale as the intersection of row 1 and column 1. C sub 2 1 refers the unit cost of the sale as the intersection of row 2 and column 1. The same is true for the net evaluation index, that's E sub ij. When we say E sub 2 2, we mean that the net evaluation index of the sale at the intersection of row 2 and column 2. E 3 2 refers the net evaluation index of the sale as the intersection of row 3 and column 2, and so on. To determine the row and column indexes by using the given formula, one requirement has to be fulfilled. That's the total number of occupied sales has to be one less than the sum of rows and columns. So the number of occupied sales is equal to one, two, three, four, five, and six, and n plus n minus one, which is equal to the number of rows, that's three, plus the number of columns, that's four, minus one, which is equal to six. Since the number of occupied sales is equal to n plus n minus one, we can proceed to calculate the row and column indexes. If not, we will have to add one or more artificially occupied sales. Let's assign row indexes as U1, U2, and U3, and column indexes as V1, V2, V3, and V4. Supply at the right and demand at the bottom have nothing to do with this iteration procedure, so we can remove them or we can keep them as they are. For this particular case, let's keep them as they are. By using these six occupied sales, we can form six equations of the form, row index plus column index is equal to unit cost of the sale. But the number of unknowns are seven, that's three row indexes and four column indexes. Whenever the number of unknowns are greater than the number of equations, it's impossible to find a unique value for each unknown. To overcome this problem, the row index of the first row, that's U1, is always assigned as zero. 
Once row one index is designated as zero, we can calculate the column and index of all occupied cells in this first row. For the cell at the intersection of row one and column one, row index that's zero plus column and index that's V sub one is equal to unit cost of the cell that's 100. This implies V sub one is equal to 100. Determining column one index will help us to calculate both row two and row three indexes because the cells at their intersection are occupied cells. Thus, for the cell at the intersection of column one and row two, row two index that's U sub two plus column one index that's 100 is equal to unit cost of the cell that's 110. This implies U sub two is equal to 10. And for the cell at the intersection of column one and row three, row three index that's U three plus column one index that's 100 is equal to 140. This implies U sub 3 is equal to 40. By using the three occupied cells, that's one in each of column 2 to column 4, we can calculate the three column indexes as 10 plus B2 is equal to 100. This implies B2 is equal to 90. 40 plus B3 is equal to 150. This implies B3 is equal to 110. And 0 plus B4 is equal to 0. This implies B4 is equal to 0. All the column and row indexes are determined. So let's proceed to calculate the net evaluation index, that's E sub IJ, for each unoccupied cell by using the formula. Net evaluation index, that's E sub IJ, is equal to unit cost of the cell, that's C sub IJ, minus row index, that's U sub I, minus column index, that's V sub J. We have two unoccupied cells in row 1. The net evaluation index of the cell at the intersection of row 1 and column 2, that's E sub 1, 2, is equal to unit cost of the cell, that's 120, minus Row 1 index, that's 0, minus column 2 index, that's 90. The difference of these values give us 30. For the cell at the intersection of row 1 and column 3, the net evaluation index is E sub 1, 3, is equal to unit cost of the cell, that's 140, minus row 1 index, that's 0, minus column 3 index, that's 110. The difference of these values, again, equal to 30. For the cell at the intersection of row 2 and column 3, the net evaluation index is E sub 2, 3, which is equal to unit cost, that's 120, minus row 2 index, that's 10, minus column 3 index, that's 110. The difference of these values give us 0. In similar manner, we can calculate the net evaluation index of the other unoccupied cells as E24 is equal to 0 minus 10 minus 0, which is equal to negative 10. E32 is equal to 130 minus 40 minus 90 equal to 0. E34 is equal to 0 minus 40 minus 0 is equal to negative 40. These calculated net evaluation index values indicate an increment or decrement of the transportation cost. If a particular unoccupied cell is chosen as an income cell, that is the cell to receive allocations. Positive net evaluation index value indicates an increase in transportation cost. Negative net evaluation index value indicates a decrease in transportation cost. And zero net evaluation index value indicates neither increment nor decrement. From this fact, we can understand that the solution is optimal only when all the net evaluation index values are greater than or equal to zero. Otherwise, we have to choose a cell with the least net evaluation index value as the incoming cell and proceed to choose the outgoing cells. Some scholars deduct the unit cost from the sum of the total row and column indexes in order to calculate the net evaluation index which is the reverse of what we have done. In such cases, the opposite of what we discuss is true, meaning the cell with the greatest net evaluation index value is considered as the incoming cell. In our problem, the two net evaluation index values, that is E24 and E34, are negative, so the solution is not optimal. The cell with the least net evaluation index value, that is the one at the intersection of row 3 and column 4, is the incoming cell, because its net evaluation index value is the least of all. When this cell is chosen as an incoming cell, one from the currently occupied cell must be chosen as an outgoing cell. So let's cast forward to step two to choose this outgoing cell. Step two, draw a closed loop starting from the identified incoming cell and end up with the same cell with a possible right angle term only at the occupied cells. Starting from the incoming cell, we can draw a straight line to the left until the adjacent occupied cell and make a right angle term upward but we can't make the next right angle turning because neither of the cells in this column are occupied cells and hence right angle turning at the unoccupied cells is impossible. So what can we do is to extend the line up to the other occupied cell in this row and then make right angle turning up to the cell at the intersection of row one and column one and then turn to a right and extend the straight line up to the occupied cell in this same row 
And finally, right angle turning to down to the starting point. Starting from the incoming cell, mark plus and minus signs alternatively at each turning cell, meaning positive sign as the incoming cell, negative sign as the second turning point, positive sign as the third turning point, and finally negative sign. Select the minimum allocated value among all the negative positions of outgoing cell. Assign its value to the incoming cell. Subtract it from all negative positions and add it to all positive positions. We have two negative positions, each with the allocation of 20. So one of these two, say the one at the intersection of row one and column four in this case, has to be chosen as an outgoing cell and its value has to be allocated to the incoming cell. Subtracting this 20 from the other negative position, that's also 20, reduce its value to zero. Also, the allocation of this cell is reduced to zero. We will keep the zero allocation as it is, rather than making it as an occupied cell, because it will serve as artificially occupied cell in the next iterations. Adding the chosen 20 to the positive position will increase its value from 210 to 230. The visible solution after first iteration looks like this. So let's continue to second iteration. That's step one, calculate the row index, that's U sub I, and column index, that's B sub J, for the occupied cells, and the net evaluation index, that's E sub IJ, for the unoccupied cells, in order to identify the next incoming cell. The formula for calculating row and column indexes is U sub I plus B sub J is equal to C sub IJ, given that row index of the first row is equal to zero. We have only one occupied cell in row one, so its row index, that's zero, plus its column and index, that's B sub one, is equal to the unit cost of the cell, that's 100, meaning B sub one is equal to 100. In the same manner, we can calculate the other row and column and indexes by using the other occupied cells as U2 plus 100 is equal to 110, meaning U2 is equal to 10. U3 plus 110 is equal to 140. This implies U3 is equal to 40. 10 plus B2 is equal to 100, this M plus B2 is equal to 90. 40 plus B3 is equal to 150, this M plus B3 is equal to 110. And 40 plus B4 is equal to 0, this M plus B4 is equal to negative 40. We determined all the row and column indexes. So let's calculate the net evaluation index for each unoccupied cell by using the formula. Net evaluation index, that's E sub IJ, is equal to Unit cost of the cell, that's C sub IJ, minus row index, that's U sub I, minus column and index, that's B sub J. For the cell at the intersection of row 1 and column 2, net evaluation index, that's E sub 1, 2, is equal to unit cost, that's 120, minus row index, that's 0, minus column and index, that's 90. The difference of these values give us 30. In similar manner, the other net evaluation indexes can be calculated as E13 is equal to 140 minus 0 minus 110, which is equal to 30. E14 is equal to 0 minus 0 plus 40, this gives us 40. E23 is equal to 120 minus 10 minus 110, which is equal to 0. E24 is equal to 0 minus 10 plus 40, which is equal to 30. And E32 is equal to 130 minus 40 minus 90, which is equal to 0. Since all the net evaluation index values are greater than or equal to zero, the solution is optimal. Thus, the optimal transportation cost is equal to 230 times 100 plus 20 times 110 plus 0 times 140 plus 350 times 100 plus 300 times 150 plus 20 times 0. 230 times 100 is 23,000 plus 20 times 110 is 2,200 plus 0 times 140 is 0, plus 350 times 100 is 35,000, plus 300 times 150 is 45,000, plus 20 times 0 is 0. The sum of these values is equal to 105,200. We know that the unit cost is given in dollar. Therefore, the total transportation cost is equal to 105,200 dollar. That's all for this part. Have a nice time.